Title Flight is an immensely popular band within the hardcore scene, having a slew of critically acclaimed records under their belt. The band consists of bassist and vocalist Ned Russin, guitarist and vocalist Jamie Roden, guitarist Shane Morin, and drummer Ben Russin. Title Fight rose to prominence in their scene in 2011 with the release of their debut record, Shed. Since then, the band has achieved great heights they never thought possible when they started. This is the story of Title Fight, a band that helped shape the modern hardcore scene with a heartfelt touch. Title Fight was formed in 2003 while its members were still in middle school. Brothers Ned and Ben, along with friend Jamie, were with the band from the very beginning. Shane joined in 2005. Coming from Kingston, a rather small, uneventful town in Pennsylvania, the adolescents had way too much time on their hands. This wasn't necessarily a town that sparked creativity, but nonetheless, Title Fight began in early 2000s suburban slumber. The band released a number of demos early in their career between 2003 and 2006, including O3's Down for the Count and O6's Light of the Eyes. These demos featured a young band with promise that hadn't quite found their way yet. Considering most of these demos were recorded before its lineup could legally drive, they're impressive all things considered. Jamie's guitar work was solid even back then and the musical chemistry was always there, but the production and the vocals were inevitably very amateurish. At the same time, what kind of 14 year olds would be making mature insightful music? These demos really remind me of early 2000s pop punk bands like Blink-182, which makes total sense as the band was still finding their sound. By 2007, the sound Title Fight is known for slowly began to surface. 2007 saw the release of both Kingston and the band split with the Erection Kids. Some sources online say Kingston was released in 2008, but Discog says December 2007, so we'll just go with that. These projects were noticeably tighter and more thought out than past works. The best way to describe Title Fight at this point in their career was pretty much pop punk with harsher, hardcore tendencies, mostly in the vocal department. Ned Russin was still coming into his own vocally, but that energy and grit he's known for is largely present on both The Split and Kingston. Let's talk about some of these songs. The first track from Kingston, Memorial Field, is super catchy with a sticky vocal melody alongside the soaring guitar. The other two tracks, Loud and Clear and Your Yeah, are pretty similar, but I love the anger and frustration in Your Yeah, the final song of the EP. Kingston is the definition of teenage angst, not reinventing the wheel, but very enjoyable for its relatability and snappy nature. The same can be said for the band Split with the Erection Kids that same year. The songs from the Split are very punk rock with a youthful radiance that's hard to deny. It may not have the luster or staying power like their later work does, but all the songs here are well performed and impactful for what they are. Gold Weight sounds like something you would hear in a Tony Hawk soundtrack. It's really energetic and immediately grabs your attention. Neck Deep is another one that fits that criteria, as well as Evander. Evander features a sick bass line that instantly hooks you. These tracks from the split would later be re-released a couple years later, and we'll get to that soon. But as it stands, these are killer tracks with attitude and conviction, coasting on hardcore with an accessible melodic edge. The band was quickly garnering local buzz in their respective hometown, playing gigs whenever they could. They even landed a slot at Warp Tour 07. The next couple years that followed would bring the band to a new level. On the music front, 2008 was largely a silent year for the band. It was primarily spent playing shows around Pennsylvania, and they were starting to extend out of their home state. Members of Title Fight were also wrapping up their high school tenures around this era, so there was more time to focus solely on the band. In late 2008, work began on the band's next release, another EP featuring three new tracks. Right as everything was starting to fall into place, the band was signed to Run For Cover Records to release the compilation, The Last Thing You Forget, on September 15, 2009. What started off as a regular EP turned into a release combining one unreleased track, Kingston, The Erection Kid Split, along with a new EP. Up until this point, the band had only released a bunch of random demos and EPs, and the last thing you forget finally changed that trend. Let's talk about it. There's not a whole lot I can say about this compilation since I've already covered a good chunk of the songs, but the three song EP itself is a powerful and logical step forward for the band. The production is more professional, Ned's voice sounds great, and it's all around the tightest the band had been by that point. Symmetry menacingly kicks the door down, short but fierce, showcasing more heavy tones and introspective aggression, leading into the aptly titled Introvert. Don't let the title fool you, cause this is a heavy track. 
Emotional shrieks and a spoken word section carry this track with a pummeling guitar, followed by an experimental conclusion. This fades effortlessly into No One Can Stay at the Top Forever. This is another one that kicks the door down, there's more melody at play, and it's a pretty memorable moment, ultimately just barely over two minutes. These three songs in succession are an absolute gut punch and see the band officially becoming the powerhouse that we all know and love. Other songs I've already mentioned, such as Memorial Field, Evander, Goldway, and Your Yeah are great as well, but I need to give a mention to the previously unreleased track, Western Haikus. It's a pretty fun, more lighthearted track that definitely shows the more playful side of the band. It's really short like most of these songs, but it's a great way to end things. The last thing you forget encompasses the best parts of 2000s pop punk while taking a heavier approach. It's fast paced and hardcore punk leaning that hardly lets up through its runtime, but there's an emotional and painful reflection here that would be explored later on in a more fleshed out manner. Going into 2010, Title Fight was hard at work, touring across the US and Japan, as well as working on their debut record. Whenever time was available, the band would write new songs and start laying down ideas. In the midst of everything going on, a new song was recorded and released in 2010 for the America's Hardcore compilation. This song would be Dreamcatchers. It's a minute and a half of what Tuttle Fight does best. Heavy guitars, emotional shouts from Ned, and steady drumming that ties all these elements together. Outside of this lone appearance, a good chunk of that year was spent writing and recording for what would become 2011's Shed. In early 2011, the band was signed to Side One Dummy Records. Shortly after, a date was set for the album's release. Recorded in the band's home state of Pennsylvania and mixed by Will Yip, Shed dropped on May 3rd, 2011. Without much else to say, let's dive into the band's now highly regarded debut. Shed saw the band crafting stronger melodies and bringing a more distinctive sound to the table. Every member of Tuttle Fight is on their A-game on this monstrous debut. The riffs have more depth and resonation, and the vocal melodies are top-notch. Shed exposes a deeper layer of the band. On the last thing you forget, they were mining for gold. On this record, there's an endless amount of it to go around. The sound is rich, incredibly dense, and it's just raw enough to keep their underground cred intact. The masterclass production as well greatly complements these songs, and there are so many noteworthy songs here. Coxton Yard and the title track Shed open the record flawlessly. The riffs are impenetrable, crushing but in such an emotive way. Flood of 72 is a hardcore punk gem, as well as You Can't Say Kingston Doesn't Love You. Safe in Your Skin briefly brings the energy down, opting to descend into inward reflection, but Your Screen Door, and especially 27, bring the energy right back. 27 is an absolute masterpiece, geniusly conveying grief and the loss of a loved one. It's another bone crusher with some impressive riffage from Jamie Roden. Stab follows and is another highlight of the record, before arriving at the closing moment, GMT or Greenwich Meantime. GMT is the emotional climax of Shed, wrapping things up effectively with a slower, more thoughtful approach. After less than 30 minutes, the record fades out, and you know you just listened to something very special. Shed is angry, ferocious, and a hardcore fan's wet dream, but beneath the nasty riffs and shouting, there's a deep introspection and inward pain, which is what makes the band so appealing. It's not just vague anger, rather genuine emotion that cuts deep and resonates with many in a real way. The conviction of Tuttle Fight is their greatest ally, and that's what makes Shed a modern masterpiece in hardcore circles. Following the record, Tuttle Fight toured the UK and Europe while having hardly any time to catch their breath. Later in 2011, Tuttle Fight released the single Mist in November. It contained a Shed B-side of the same name, as well as a re-recorded version of Dreamcatchers. The band's fanbase was growing exponentially, and going into 2012, things seemed exceedingly bright. The band was enjoying themselves and making the best music of their career. At this point, nothing could stop their drive. 2012 saw Tuttle Fight playing a lot of shows and continuing their upward trajectory. Production for the band's second record began in the first part of that year, which was a very fast turnaround, one that most didn't expect. It's clear the band was in the zone creatively and that passion was put directly into Floral Green. For Tuttle Fight's second record, not a lot changed. It was produced by Will Yip, just like Shed, was recorded in their homestay, and they were on the same label, except the band was given more time to bring LP2 to life. On July 24th, 2012, the song Head in the Ceiling Fan was released online, and also received a music video. Though still heavy, you can definitely sense a bit of a changing sound. Head in the Ceiling Fan features singing instead of shouting, indie instead of hardcore, and is generally more somber than angry. But this slightly new direction suited the band well, and this track would go down as one of their most beloved. 
On September 18th, 2012, Floral Green was officially released. Let's jump right into the record. The record opens with Numb But I Still Feel It. Immediately, the band's classic sound is in full swing. A wall of intensity encapsulates this track, leading it to the absolute banger, Leaf. Jamie's riff on the chorus steals the show, and it's such a fun track. Secret Society is another heavy cut with a crushing riff and a dirty bass line. Then comes the obvious highlight of Floral Green, Head in the Ceiling Fan. I already talked about this one, but it's a truly incredible song. Inspired by the likes of Hum, it's a career-defining moment for Tuttle Fight that still follows them to this day. Sympathy is a noteworthy, sonic youth-inspired jam, while Callus is a simple but fun track, indirectly inspired by Nirvana, funny enough. The final song, In Between, is one that Jamie Roden actually hated at first, but over the span of a few weeks with some reworking, his opinion shifted and here we are today. This track contains some stylish riffage with a soft side that really grips you, it has such an entrancing mood that makes it hard to tire of. Floral Green comes to an end in just over half an hour. Title Fight's second record was fortunately not an infamous sophomore slump, instead it takes the sound of Shed and expands upon it, showcasing some super heavy moments combined with some softer ones that come to life so well. Floral Green boasts lusciousness as well as the band's classic sound, featuring a bit of slow progressions, clean vocals, and chilling feedback. These elements would become a huge part of the band later on. Following Floral Green, a tour ensued and the band saw continued success. The record would make it to the Billboard 200, peaking at number 69, before falling off the charts after just one week. This isn't exactly an amazing feat, but for a hardcore band like Tuttle Fight, it's pretty impressive to make the charts at all. The band would leave Side One Dummy Records in 2012, opting to sign to Revelation Records. This move set the stage for their next release. 2012 and 2013 were big years for the band, touring around the world and cementing themselves as major players in their scene. When the band had a short window to collect themselves in 2013, a few projects were lined up. The band made an appearance on a compilation record with the song Another One. They also released a single with Touche Amore covering their song Face Ghost. Shortly after that, Title Fight got to work on their next official release in the form of an EP. The EP would be entitled Spring Songs. On August 12, 2013, the song Be A Toy was released in anticipation. Let's talk about it. Be A Toy is a track heavily inspired by indie rock. It's very melodic and easygoing, further featuring the softer side of the band. But there's still some wicked feedback and a rough around the edges approach that keeps the song fresh and interesting. The opener, Blush, is more typical affair for Title Fight, more enraged vocals from Ned with a chaotic vibe throughout. Receiving Line is super chill and laid back. This is one of the band's longer tracks, and its runtime is spent mostly building a slow progression. Definitely an outlier for this release, leading us to the closer, Hypnotize. This one has more grit than the previous track, bringing a lot of energy and passion to the table, which is what Tuttle Fight does best. This EP is a nice change of pace for the band, demonstrating they can effectively change up their sound, while still retaining what makes them so captivating. Spring Songs is the perfect buffer between Floral Green and their next release, which would change things up even more. Following Spring Songs, the band left Revelation Records. It wasn't until the next year in 2014 the band signed with Anti Records to release their third studio album. Title Fight played some shows throughout the first half of 2014, before getting to work on LP3, which would become Hyperview. Like their previous three releases, Hyperview would be recorded at Studio 4 in Pennsylvania, and was produced by Will Yip. Recording took place in the summer of 2014 over a month or two. Hyperview would take the experimentation from Floral Green and Spring Songs and double down. Going into late 2014 and early 2015, ahead of Hyperview's release, three songs were dropped ahead of time. Chlorine was dropped in December 2014, Rose of Sharon in January 2015, as well as Your Pain Is Mine Now that same month. Chlorine takes clear inspiration from Shoegaze. The guitar tone is very reminiscent of bands such as Slow Dive and My Bloody Valentine. The vocals are muddy and subdued, which was definitely intentional. The song is washy and dissonant, radically different from prior work, but still golden. Rose of Sharon features some unclean vocals once again, but instead of hardcore punk chaos, the song is doused in reverb and creates an atmosphere so well. Your Pain Is Mine Now is pretty much the same. The influence these guys took is becoming increasingly more and more undeniable. I hear influences ranging from the Stone Roses to Sonic Youth to Dinosaur Jr., and it's honestly incredible. The sound change is so extreme, it's almost a novelty. 
Anyway, Hyperview dropped on February 3rd, 2015. Let's get right into this. The opener, Murder Your Memory, is a simple moment full of emotion that sets the stage for the record really well. I'd say this one gives you a good idea of what to expect next. M-R-A-H-C, or Charm spelled backwards, is a faster tempo jam with so much flair and genuine style, it's hard to deny. The same exact thing can be said for Trace Me On To You, which is a really playful track with an upbeat energy, featuring some more fuzzy guitars, enveloping you in its slumberous haze. Dizzy is slower and brooding, with harmonious conviction and a taste for the ethereal. Then we arrive at the closer, New Vision, which brings the energy back for a rocking moment, with a sensitivity, which is what makes Title Fight so great. Hyperview features an abundance of fuzzy, dreamy guitars, along with a subtle vibe of melancholy that totally sells the shift in style. You can tell these guys love shoegaze, and with so many influences from so many different corners, this sound change was inevitable. These tracks bleed authenticity and a somberness, elevating the band to new heights. Hyperview proves the band can explore more introspective genres such as indie, shoegaze, and dream pop with complete and total ease. While the record is radically different from Shed and Floral Green, their core identity is still here and can be felt all over this thing. I can understand some fans weren't exactly huge on Hyperview, as it's not at all what they expected, but for what it's worth, this is a killer album that showcases a side of title fight that was bound to come out sometime. Real artists aren't afraid to delve into new territory, and the band effectively proved that here with 2015's Hyperview. The band went on to play a lengthy tour, and played a ton of shows in support of the new record. They toured with a lot of spew, milk teeth, among many others. Hyperview would make its way onto the Billboard 200 like Floral Green, and peaked at number 78. Following the busy year, which was 2015 for the band, they were inactive for quite a while. For over six months following the end of 2015, Title Fight would be mostly MIA, before picking up momentum again in May 2016. From then until January 2017, the band played a bunch of shows, still supporting Hyperview. But after that, aside from one standalone show in January 2018, Title Fight has been completely inactive and are unofficially on hiatus. There was never any formal announcement or anything, they just kinda stopped playing. I'm sure a large part of the reason was due to the insane schedule the band had for so long. Rarely taking breaks, burnout is a very real possibility. To this day, Nobody really knows if the band has any plans to release more music. For now, the future of Title Fight is uncertain and hangs in the balance. Title Fight is a band with a dedicated and loyal fan base that will likely stick around for a long time. They've proven their talent and versatility as musicians many times over. But one thing is for sure, all three of their records, Shed, Floral Green, and Hyperview, are totally untouchable. This is a band that knows how to make a great record, and hopefully we'll get another one in the future. But the members of Title Fight have remained busy. Ned has a pretty successful project called Glitterer, and from what I've gathered, Jamie went back to school to further his studies. As I said, the band is MIA, and has been for quite some time. But at the end of the day, if Title Fight never reforms, we still have a ton of music to help ease the blow. This was the story of Title Fight, a band that began as chaotic hardcore before being rebirthed as modern shoegaze heroes. That might be a bit of a stretch, but to put it simply, there will never be another band quite like them. Thanks for watching, I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much for 3,000 subs, I really appreciate it. I never in a million years thought I'd ever have that many subs when I started. Anyway, I hope you all have a great day and I will see you soon. Cheers.